Welcome back for part two of the lecture. I'm going to start over with the schedule one, just in case you took a break and are coming back. Um, so schedule one drugs are highly addictive, have no acceptable medical use. An example of this is heroin. It's illegal to process, distribute, and to use. And the only time that it may be used is if it's approved for careful uh, controlled research in carefully controlled research facilities. And that's for Schedule 1. So Schedule 2, they are considered, well, didn't move. <laughs> schedule 2 considered that they have a high potential for physical and psychological addiction. A written prescription is required. There are no refills allowed, and some of these um, examples of these would be cocaine, Rillin, oxycodone. So in order to um, get a refill on this, then you have to go back to the doctor and receive that handwritten prescription. Schedule three, these are considered to be moderately addicting and they can lead to a limited dependence. They will give five refills within a six month time period here. And many are combinations of less addictive medications with a small amount of narcotic. So for example, hydrocodone or Tylenol-3. And the prescriber must sign the prescription and it's written by an allied health professional. The Schedule 4 has a lower abuse potential. The prescriber must sign the prescription, and it is prescribed by an allied health professional. In this schedule, in Schedule 4, they do allow fax and phone orders. And again, we see the five refills in six months. So some examples of this might be Ativan, Ativan sorry, Valium, or Xanax. Schedule 5 is the lowest potential for abuse. Some over-the-counter um, in some states require a signature and identification of the patient in order to pick up even an over-the-counter that is regulated by this schedule. Examples of this might be a cough suppressant with small amount of codeine or diarrhea preparations, as well as um, we now know when we go to the pharmacy in California in order to get Sudafed, for example, we might be using it for a decongestant, but because it can be used to make um, and manufacture methamphetamines, they now regulate that as well so that they can see the signature and uh, the ID of the person who's actually purchasing it. So controlled substance management in all offices that contain controlled substances, there are strict guidelines that must be followed. First of all, an inventory log is maintained and it's checked daily. Records are kept in the office for two years. So all the records in any relation to the scheduled drugs are kept for two full years. And they should be kept in a double locked safe cabinet. If loss or theft is uh, significant a police report should be filled out as well as the DEA form 106 must be filed and this uh, will also include the prescriber that holds the registration number that we talked about earlier in the first lecture and then we all will always follow agency policies for disposal and again once you're working in an office you will follow their protocol and they will be following strictly the controlled substance management it's important to be aware that drugs have slang names and uh, street street names are the slang names and both legal and illegal drugs can have slang names. So it's important to kind of keep up with this and follow so that if you're hearing a legal or illegal drug by its slang name, you can kind of relate to what drug that it is being talked about. So substance abuse. I'm sure that not only in the healthcare profession, but many of us sitting here listening to this lecture have been affected in some way by substance abuse. And it's a drug addiction and a drug addiction, well, we're talking about drugs that could be alcohol as well, but in this case, the drug addiction is compulsive, maladaptive, and dependence on a drug. 
So the dependence can be physical and or psychological. So again, physical would be the chemical dependence. Psychological would be um, what your mind, how your mind or your brain and body psychologically is affected. Drug tolerance is the progressive decrease in a drug's effectiveness after repeated use. So we see this often in drugs and alcohol again that as a person takes more and more of that drug or drinks more and more of the alcohol, then they build a tolerance to it, which means that they need a higher dose of that drug or um, a higher amount of that alcohol in order to reach that same effect. And habituation is the progressive psychological dependence on a drug. And again, the root word of habituation is habit. So you can think of it as um, habit forming and that psychologically we are dependent on that. It's important to know how to prevent substance abuse to the best of your ability. And so here are some ways that we can do that as healthcare providers. And also we can utilize this in our life with our family and friends. So it's important to know local resources such as support groups, employee assistance programs, AA, different resources that are available to help in preventing or treating substance abuse. If a coworker is impaired, you must report that to a supervisor. Again, we work in healthcare and we need to um, always be accountable for the safety of ourself and our patients. And don't cover up an appropriate behavior. Again, you need to communicate in order to uh, keep your patient safe. If the impaired person has a license, the supervisor should report the behavior to the State Board of Medicine or Nursing or the other appropriate licensing agency, and practice may be limited for a period of time based on this report. Abusers lose families and jobs before getting help, so covering up abuse is not really helping the situation at all. Sometimes we feel like we want to cover it up because we don't want them to lose their job, but again, we need to always remember that the bottom line is safety for ourselves and for our patients, and if a person is a, impaired by substances on the job, um, it can be, well, it, it could even cause death, so harm or death to a patient. Signs of possible substance abuse in a coworker. Again, these are just possible signs. It doesn't mean if you see one or two or even three of these that, oh, it's definitely substance abuse. But these are things that we typically see in somebody who is abusing substances. So if they're frequently late or absent from work because of, quote, illness, um, if they are irritable and defensive or withdrawn, they make frequent mistakes. If they do not keep their scheduled appointments or they have difficulty working with many staff members, you start to see that um, communication is difficult. They might lash out at multiple staff members um, as well as you'll see this uh, with patients. You'll see them that they start to relate to the patient unprofessionally and not treat the patient well. You can also look for physical symptoms and changes in appearance. Typically changes in appearance, they start to not take care of themselves and they don't do their normal daily hygiene. And these all can be signs that there's possible substance abuse. For our last comprehension checkpoint, here's the question. The DEA assigns controlled substances to one of five schedules based on their a. Tolerance, B. Abuse potential, C. Number of prescriptions allowed, or D. Ability to cause overdoses. If you selected B because you know that the DEA assigns controlled substances due to one of five schedules based on their abuse potential, <laughs> you were correct because they are assigned based on abuse potential. I hope you have a great day and I'll see you in class. Bye-bye.